welcome to part four in our series called The End. And we are studying the ten key prophetic events. The ten key events that will lead up to the end of this world as we know it now and the beginning of a new world. Now there are more than ten key prophetic events in the Bible. But we're looking at the ten most important, the most prominent, so that we can understand what God's plan is for the end times. And this morning, we're going to talk about the Antichrist, the central figure, the central person, the central individual who literally dominates the period known as the Tribulation. Now, I want to begin by placing the Antichrist in prophetic context. So take out, if you would, that chart that I provided for you. It's the end of your outlines, the end, an overview of our future events as revealed in the Bible. And starting on the left-hand side here, you see the first coming of Jesus Christ to earth, born in Bethlehem, his ministry 33 years. He died, rose again, ascended into heaven. And then the church age begins at the day of Pentecost, which has been going on for 2,000 plus years. Below that, you see signs, birth pains. The Bible reveals several signs or birth pains that will grow in their intensity and occurrence as we get closer to the end. We studied 16 of those. Then you'll notice the next event, the rapture, the snatching away of believers from earth to meet the Lord in the air. This is a future event, but that could happen any second. And then begins the tribulation, a seven-year period of time of distress leading up to the world's destruction. And in our last session, we studied deeply the tribulation. We, de- we detailed what the Bible talked about in terms of the literal environmental destruction of planet Earth during that seven-year period of time. We talked about the seal and trumpet and bold judgments, 19 judgments that will literally culminate in the physical destruction of planet Earth. What we didn't talk about in that message A whole lot is what happens to earth during this seven-year period of time with people. What happens politically on earth? What happens religiously and socially, economically, and even militarily? And to understand those matters, you've got to understand the role of Antichrist. Because the world politically, religiously, socially, economically, and militarily will literally be, be dominated by this guy. Now, think about a dictator. Think about maybe Hitler. He might come to mind. You think of Germany. Think about Stalin. And You think of of Russia. Think about a dictator. Now think about a world dictator, and you've got the Antichrist. The Bible predicts that one man will literally take control of the entire world. This person will be Satan's superman, Satan's CEO, his chief, chief executive officer, The Bible calls him the Antichrist. And this morning, we're going to ask and answer several questions about the Antichrist and his devastating reign of terror on this world during the seven years of tribulation. You say, Mark, can it get any worse than what we studied with just the physical ramifications of the tribulation? Yes, the answer is yes. It can actually get worse. Let's begin with some general questions, and then we'll move to some more specifics. First question, who is the Antichrist? Well, the Bible is silent about the identity of the Antichrist. We can't know who he is, but we can know what he is and what he does. As a matter of fact, there are more than 100 passages in the Bible that discuss the Antichrist. I mean, he is exposed for who he is, and there's a lot written about him. Now, let me begin by just saying this. The Antichrist is a person who will be against Christ. That prefix anti, primarily, primarily it means against. The Antichrist will overtly oppress Christ and all who represent Christ. He will ruthlessly persecute, torture, and kill God's people. And he will lead the armies of this world into the climactic battle of Armageddon in an attempt to watch this destroy God, which will miserably fail. The Antichrist will be the most powerful dictator this world has ever seen, making Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Castro, they will seem tame in comparison. He will carry out every wish of Satan and will be empowered to do whatever Satan desires him to do. Second, the Antichrist is a person who will seek to replace Christ. The prefix anti 
Anti can also mean instead of. Not just against, but instead of. The Antichrist will seek to be a substitute for Christ. Christ is the true Messiah. The Antichrist will claim to be the true Messiah. He will actually claim himself to be God and will convince the world that he in fact is God. He will demand the worship of every person on earth. He will come in imitation of Christ. He will be a pseudo-Christ. He will come to replace Christ. So the Antichrist is a person who when he comes, he'll be against Christ, Antichrist, but also come to replace Christ. Now, the term Antichrist, the literal word, is only used four times in the Bible. And when it's used, it's referred, it, 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 when it's used, it's used, first of all, uh, to talk about the spirit of Antichrist that exists in our world today, the spirit that's Antichrist. And second, it's used to actually refer to the person, the actual Antichrist, who will be revealed as we get closer to the end of the age. Here's a couple of verses, 1 John 4, 3 in your outline. Every spirit that, did not, that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. You may have known some people who have exude this spirit. They're Antichrist. Many cults, they're Antichrist, and even their doctrine and what they share. What you have heard is coming, and then even now is already in the world. That's one way the word Antichrist is used. This spirit that permeates the world that's Antichrist. But then it refers to the person, 1 John 2.18. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. You see, there have been many, and even now are many little a, little a Antichrists. But one day, the capital A, Antichrist, will appear. Now watch this. Although the term Antichrist is used only four times in the Bible, it's important to realize that Antichrist uses numerous aliases. Numerous terms there are in the Bible that are not Antichrist, but are representing this person who is called the Antichrist. So here's another question. What are some additional names for the Antichrist? Well, there are more than, watch this, 25 different titles given to the Antichrist in the Old and even New Testament. I've just given you kind of a, a, a sample. He's known in, uh, as the little horn in Daniel 7.8. In Daniel 9.26, he's called the ruler who will come. In Daniel 8.23, a fierce king. Daniel 8.23, also a master of intrigue. Daniel 11.21, a contemptible person. Zechariah 11.17, the worthless shepherd. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, the man of lawlessness. Revelation 13.1, the beast. I mean, what do you, can you imagine one of these terms being ascribed to you? <laughs> Look at who this guy is. These terms paint a picture of the most despicable man ever to walk the planet. Some believe he will be Satan incarnate. We know for sure that Satan gives him his power and position. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel. As a matter of fact, put your finger in Daniel, put your finger in the book of Revelation. We'll be in these two books the entire time. And I want you to just hear from God's word, God's description right from Scripture that gives you an overall of the Antichrist, his character, who he will be. I'm not going to teach on this right now. I just want you to listen to the word of God. Daniel 8, 23 to 25 describes the Antichrist. In the latter part of their reign... When rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, this is the Antichrist, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not on his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Wow. Now, John Phillips uh, is a scholar, and if we took everything that the Bible has to say about the Antichrist in terms of his character, I don't have time to do that study. We've done a little bit of it, but he has, and this is a good statement, a summary of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be an attractive, charismatic figure, a genius, a demon-controlled, devil-taught charmer of men. 
He will have answers to the horrendous problems of mankind. He will be all things to all men, a political statesman, a social lion, a financial wizard, an intellectual giant, a religious deceiver, a masterful orator, a gifted organizer. He will be Satan's masterpiece of deception, the world's world's false messiah. With boundless enthusiasm, the masses will follow him and readily enthrone him in their hearts as the world's savior and God. That's who we're talking about. Now, what does the Bible mean when it says Antichrist number is 666? You may have heard this. Actually, in Revelation 13, 18 says, Let him calculate the number of the beast, that's the Antichrist, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Now, we're going to talk about the mark of the beast later. But what's in focus here is the number of the beast, which is 666. Now, through numerology, people have calculated all sorts of, of potential names for the identity of the Antichrist. I mean, Kissinger and Hitler and Stalin. Now, I don't believe that from this scripture right here, uh, God is telling us that through some sort of slick calculation, we can determine the Antichrist's personal name. Again, we have to take scripture literally, plainly, simply. What does the Bible say? Let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. It is man's number. You see, the number six is the number of man, always, whenever you read the Bible. Man was created on the sixth day. Man is to work six out of seven days. So the number 6666 is man tripled. Man with three exclamation points behind it. The Bible is saying the Antichrist represents the ultimate in human ingenuity, competence, looks, stability, ability, Brilliance. We're talking about Satan's Superman, Satan's superstar. That's what the Bible means when it says that his number, the number of man, 666. So just, this is just introduction. I'm just wanting you, especially those who this, this is new to, the Antichrist will be Satan's Superman, the coming world dictator, a man who will be against Christ and will come to replace Christ. He will claim to be God. During the tribulation, he will function as a ruler, a fierce king, a master of intrigue, a contemptible person, a worthless shepherd, a man of lawlessness. He will be physically attractive, an intellectual genius, a financial wizard, a political statesman, a masterful orator, an unbelievable administrator, religious deceiver, the world's false messiah, who will ultimately lead all surviving humanity to their deaths in the battle of Armageddon, which we will study We'll take an hour to just look at that one battle. And this will all be in defiance to God because he's coming against God, but also to replace God. And guess what? The world is going to follow him. It's going to be unbelievable and horrific. Now, let's ask some specific questions. That was just introduction, general. Let's get specific. What will Antichrist's reign be like politically? Let me give you five thoughts. Number one, He will emerge out of the revived Roman European Empire. This guy will be European. Now, through Daniel, approximately 2,500 years ago in the book of Daniel, God outlines the remaining days of the world. We looked at this a little bit in previous message. In chapter 2, 7, and 9, God provides this chronological outline of the world, leading to the end of the world. God told Daniel that there would be four and only four world kingdoms or empires that would rule the world until literally the end of humanity as we know it. The first kingdom was Babylon, which was followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greeks, then the Romans. The last world kingdom before the end of the world will be made up of a restored Roman European Empire. Now watch this. There have only been four world kingdoms. There have have been many would-be world kingdoms, you know, uh, sought to become that. Many have tried to become the fifth kingdom, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, others, to name a couple, but all attempts at world dominance, I'm talking dominance, have failed. Why? Because God said there will only be four world kingdoms, and the last kingdom will be a revived Roman European empire, and the Antichrist will arise from this remade-up European world empire, which we are seeing emerge today. Now, in Daniel 2.44, God says this, In the time of those kings 
And he, the kings here are rulers of the ten parts of this revived European empire. This empire, when it emerges, will have ten parts to it, okay? And the Antichrist will be one of those at the beginning. We'll see this in a second. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. This will be the final world kingdom before the end comes. It will be ten parts. Antichrist will be leading it, and it will be European in its dominance, Now, the concentration of power, I wish I had time to go into this. It's amazing to look at it. In today's European Union, it's absolutely astounding. When you see what's going on here, let me just quote David Jeremiah here right now. He says this, quote, Gradually and steadily the nations of Europe have come together, creating a modern replica of the ancient Roman Empire. This is happening, and many Christians are blind to it. We're not seeing it. Europe is more integrated today than at any time since the days of ancient Rome. The United States of Europe is now considered by many to be the second most powerful political and economic force in the world. It will continue to grow in its prominence. Now, a lot of times people will ask me, is the Antichrist alive today? And my answer is, maybe. I mean, how close do you think we are to the end? If you think we're close to the end, well, maybe he is alive today. Maybe he's just a little boy. Maybe he's already in a position of leadership. I don't know, but I know this much. He will, the Antichrist, emerge out of a revived Roman European Empire. Secondly, politically, he will begin inconspicuously. The Bible is clear on this, Revelation 3.1. And I saw a beast, that's the Antichrist, coming out of the sea. This is how he begins to emerge. And the sea is always a reference in the book of Revelation to the general mass of Gentile humanity. He will be one of many political leaders at first, not overly obvious, kind of like Hitler in the beginning. And Hitler in the beginning was a nobody. He just slowly began to rise to prominence. He's just going to be one of many at the beginning, not notoriety, you know, not, not huge splash. He's going to slowly move out of the mass. Thirdly, he will gain public attention through diplomatic brilliance. And we saw this in the first Sealed judgment, didn't we? Revelation 6, 2. I looked and there before me was a white horse. This is the Antichrist. We studied this verse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out to conquer, bent on conquest. The bow here, no arrows. And he begins through diplomatic strategy, showing his brilliance. As a matter of fact, you go back to Daniel chapter 7 and we see just this very moment in history prophesied. Listen to this, and just the description here is is chilling in many ways. Daniel 7, verses 7 to 8. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast. Here is the final European Roman Empire, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had a large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. This, This is speaking about the end. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns, made up of ten parts, this will be. Verse 8, while I was thinking about the horns, these ten parts, there before me was another horn, a little one. This is the Antichrist, which came up among them. He comes up among these ten. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Through political shrewdness, the little horn, Antichrist, will rip out by the roots three of these kingdoms. Antichrist will diplomatically begin to claw his way toward becoming a big horn, and he will succeed. He will absolutely be dominant, still yet future. Fourth thought about this, his political reign of terror. Four, he will distinguish himself like no other politician ever has. Daniel 11.21 says he will seize it through intrigue. Seize what? The Antichrist will seize people. To be in his presence would be to be captivated. He will seize power, politicians, world leaders, celebrities will bow at this guy's feet. He will seize countries, nations through political genius, master diplomacy, brilliant leadership, and genius problem solving. People will be in awe of this guy. They will say he is the Messiah. Fifthly, he will stun the world by solving the Middle East crisis. Wow. This is where everything turns at this point. 
Every politician, every political leader has dreamt of solving the Middle East crisis, right? I mean, President Carter, Clinton, Bush, Henry Kissinger, Obama just recently, but they have done their very best and have failed. Where others have failed, watch this, the Antichrist will succeed. You think about the Middle East crisis today, what's going on here. Israel's very existence has generated the hatred of numerous nations, primarily the Arab world, who wants to see Israel literally, quote, wiped off the face of this earth. Out of 192 countries in our world today, Israel has, out of all of those, only 18 friends. And even those 18 friends, I mean, they're up for grabs. Even the United States right now, where are we at with Israel? Pretty pathetic. The Antichrist will say to the leaders of Israel, this is yet future, during the tribulation, okay? He's going to say, let's talk. Let's have a little conversation. Do you see all that I've done? Do you see my manipulating and how I'm growing in my power? I'm in control, and I want to take you guys under my wing. I will guarantee your safety, and I'll defend you from all these Arab countries. I'm not Arab. Look at me. I'm you, like the United States, European. We're together. We're allies. And I, I want to protect you from these countries that want to destroy you. Just all you need to do is sign this covenant for seven years. And you can continue to practice your religion in your temple and all be well. Israel at this point in their history, they will be exhausted from years of continual conflict and they will sign the covenant with Antichrist. Daniel 9.27 says, He will make a covenant with many for one seven or seven years. And the tribulation begins at this moment with the signing of the covenant. The earth from this moment has exactly seven years left before its destruction. Once Israel and the Antichrist signed this covenant. Now environmentally, environmentally, the world at this point will literally begin to fall apart. They will begin to experience the 19 judgments we studied in our last message. But politically, at the beginning of the tribulation, the world is absolutely going to be astonished, in awe, amazed at the Antichrist leadership. As a matter of fact, Revelation 13.3 says, the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Now, Due to time constraints, I don't have time to track the Antichrist's uh, continual political movement all the way through, although we'll come back to it when we study the Battle of Armageddon. But just generally speaking, let me just generally. The first half of the tribulation politically is a time when the Antichrist jockeys for position. And he comes to greater and greater prominence, ultimately being hailed and accepted and elevated to the position of world leader. I mean, this guy is going to be slow and gradual and just people would be blown away. Generally speaking, the second half of the tribulation is known as the Great Tribulation, in part because politically, this is where the Antichrist begins to show his true colors. He begins to show that he is a brutal dictator, demanding absolute control, submission and allegiance, or else death. Now, what we're going to do right now is leave politics for a little bit and talk about another aspect of the Antichrist's reign of terror. And this is even more important to understand, and this has to do with what will the Antichrist's reign be like spiritually. I want to give you nine thoughts here. This is fascinating, it's dark, it's sinister, it's, it's pretty incredible. Now, if you're a Christian, you will not be here during this time in history. I want you to know that. But nevertheless, some of you are going, ah. Oh, So glad. That's why you need to listen to the previous messages. We're talking about the period of the tribulation. The rapture's already happened. We'll get into that in a little bit. What will the Antichrist reign be like spiritually? Number one is this. Spiritual darkness will reign on this earth like you can't imagine. So what do you mean by that? Well, number one, the Holy Spirit will be removed. We talked about this. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. Once the rapture happens, okay, that's the next event on God's calendar, right? Prophetic calendar. Every believer is taken from earth 
to heaven to be with the Lord in the air, and the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer will by default be taken out of the way. Can you imagine a world with no Christians and no Holy Spirit? That will be the world right after the rapture. That will be the world in which the Antichrist will reign. Secondly, many Christians don't realize this. A diluting influence will be added. Now, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This will be the only scripture we'll look at outside of Daniel and Revelation. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Two, very important, I want to read the scripture and then I'll interpret it for you. A deluding influence will be added. This is shocking. Many Christians have no clue that this is what's on the horizon. Verses 8 through 12. And then the lawless one will be revealed. This is the Antichrist. Whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one, this is the Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, that is, Satan will empower him, displaying all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish. We'll talk about the day in a second. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. What is going on here? Watch this. All who have heard the truth, watch this, prior to the rapture. Let's apply this to you. You're here. You've heard the gospel, but you've not responded to the gospel. You've hardened your heart. I'm not going to humble myself and believe. Watch this. All who have heard the gospel prior to the rapture will be given a deluding influence. That means this. The day of grace is over for you. You will believe the delusion. You will believe believe the lie. What's the lie? Antichrist is your savior. You will believe that message. And you will die believing that lie. You say, Mark, won't there be tons of people saved in the tribulation? Yes. But those will be people, watch this, who have never heard the gospel. Right now on this planet, there are 2 billion people, 2 billion that have never heard the name of Jesus. Those are the people that will be saved. Those who have heard the gospel, who have had the privilege to hear the gospel, in this day of grace, the rapture happens, it's over for you. A deluded, your judgment has begun. You will have seven years to live. And in that time, you will be given over, deceived, believing the Antichrist. And let me tell you, the whole world is going to follow the Antichrist. Day of grace is over. So, you know, be warned. Do not play with the gospel. Do not play around with God. Some think, well, you know, hell, just kind of wait. And, you know, when this thing plays out and the rapture happens, then I'll know that, you know, this Jesus thing is real and then I'll repent and come to Christ. No, you won't. You will be judged at that point. The judgment will be a delusion so powerful, you will actually believe Antichrist is Savior, and you will die in your sins, and you'll go to hell. Judgment, the day of grace. We are living in the day of grace until the rapture happens, beloved. This is, that's why the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Right now. I mean, it's amazing. The world will be literally falling apart in the tribulation. Have you seen this? I mean, it's just, you look at it, you go, How? Revelation chapter uh, 9 just describes this. this. The world is falling apart, literally before their very eyes, and this is how people act. Revelation 9 verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plague still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols and gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood and idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, and their thefts. And you have to ask, why? Because they're deluded. They've been judged. It's just a matter of time. Wow, that's heavy. What's it going to be like spiritually under the Antichrist reign? Spiritual darkness will reign. And lastly, flourishing evil will dominate this period. Revelation 13, 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. You see, the world at this point in history will be taken up with satanic worship. The the worship of Satan will dominate everywhere. Unbelievable. Second thought about his spiritual reign. He will break his covenant halfway through the tribulation 
and turn on the Jews. Now, many of you know this. You look at your little outline there. Look halfway through the tribulation, covenant broken. Now, there are numerous passages of Scripture that describe this moment in history. It's all through the Bible. Daniel 9.27 is one Scripture. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is the Antichrist with Israel, seven years covenant. In the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and a wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Now, what is going on there? Well, the picture we have is that the Jews will have rebuilt their temple in Jerusalem by this time in history. They will begin sacrificing again. Remember, the Jews do not believe Jesus is Messiah. They've rejected that. And in the tribulation, the the Antichrist will give the Jews the ability to resume worship. And they'll be sacrificing. And by the way, all the temple items needed for the sacrifice have already been constructed. I've seen them with my own eyes. If you've been to Jerusalem with me, many of you have gone, we've gone into the, the, uh, the, the literal temple museum, and these, this is a literal picture, picture of the menorah that literally has been constructed and is ready to be put into use in the temple, the new temple to begin. The altar's been created. Everything, the Jews are ready to roll when it comes to the re-sacrificing system, you know, being inaugurated, brought back. They're ready. They're ready. You see these things happen, you go, wow, the Bible, it's so real. Now, uh, so they're going to begin sacrificing animals. Now, halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years in, the Antichrist will walk into the temple, the holy place, and will claim himself to be God, desecrate the temple by moving his image into the temple. We're going to talk about what that means later, and he will begin to slaughter thousands of Jews in the most bloody persecution they have ever experienced in their history. It will literally be a bloodbath. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 talks about it. The man doomed to destruction, that's Antichrist, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple in Jerusalem proclaiming himself to be God. Jesus said this, Mark 13, 14. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And the Jews will flee, but they will be persecuted big time. We'll talk about this later in the Battle of Armageddon. Now, those of you who know your history know that there was a minor abomination of desolation that took place in Jewish history when a Syrian king, okay, who ruled Palestine at that time, named Antiochus Epiphanes marched into Jerusalem literally in 168 BC. He slaughtered 40,000 men, Jewish men, women, and children. Why? For one reason. He was angry and, he, and they believed in God. They believed in Yahweh. Whoever was found with a Torah was instantly put to death. Women's sons who were circumcised, little boys, were literally put to death. Hanging the babies from their mother's necks and executing their husbands before their very eyes because the husbands performed the circumcision on that little boy. It was a bloodbath. Antiochus then walked into the holy temple in Jerusalem, and he did the unfathomable. He demanded that the priest, the high priest, worship the Greek god Zeus. He forced the priests, threw them on the ground. He, He forced them to build altars to Zeus and then to offer swine, pigs, upon these altars. Whoever refused was instantly killed. The unholy sacrifice of unclean animals on the sacred temple altar is the minor abomination of desolation. Just a type of the major abomination of desolation that the Antichrist is prophesied to bring upon the Jews with consuming hatred. And one can only imagine, if this was the little abomination that took place back then, what the Antichrist will do in that temple and do the Jews is beyond what your mind can conceive. Third thought about his reign spiritually. He will persecute, torture, and kill the saints by the millions. Revelation 12, the Bible is so filled with this. During the tribulation, Revelation 12, 12, he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. We'll talk about that at another message. 
Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman, that's Israel, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who believe in Christ, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. These are just scriptures at random that talk about his slaughter on God's people. Daniel 7, 21, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. Daniel 8, 24, he will destroy the holy people. Revelation 13, 7, he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, and language and nation. Revelation 6, 9. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. I mean, this will be a bloodbath. Antichrist will literally uh, slay tribulation saints as well as Jews. Tribulation saints, those who come to faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. This will be unequal to anything the world has ever seen. Holocaust, whatever. It will be unbelievable. Fourth, point about his reign spiritually of terror. He will kill God's two witnesses. Now, some of you are hoping we get to this. So take your Bibles, Revelation chapter 11. Let's read an amazing scripture here that talks about, again, the tribulation, the Antichrist, and his interaction with what's going on on earth during this time of history. Now, the Bible promises that the gospel is going to go out into all the world. And, and God will literally raise up different ones to share the gospel during this time in history. Revelation 11. And let's pick it up. I don't know. Let's look at verses 3. I'll just read it. I'm very tempted to preach on this, but I can't. I'm just going to read it, and then we'll comment. And I, was, and, and, I, and, was give, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, let me just, this is Moses and Elijah, okay? Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. Won't that be cool? This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the water into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony, preaching, okay, in Jerusalem, the beast, Antichrist, that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street on the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, uh, where also their Lord was crucified. This is Jerusalem. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, nation will gaze on their bodies, how? Through television, and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them. They'll be having a party. That's how just decrepit people will be. And will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets, preachers, who are preaching the gospel, had tormented those who live on earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck all who saw them. Wow. Now, the Bible doesn't say when these two witnesses begin their ministry. Most believe, I believe that they will come at the beginning of the tribulation, right after the signing of the covenant. Most believe this is Moses and Elijah because of all the signs that they're exercising. They did so in the Old Testament. They have power to control weather, turn water into blood, strike the earth with any type of plague they choose. They will preach against the Antichrist. They will preach Jesus as Lord and Savior. They will preach about the wickedness of people and their need to repent, they will tell people that God is responsible for all of the judgments that are being poured out on earth that we talked about, and that more are to come. They're going to warn the world. Men will try to destroy them. I mean, Antichrist will say, go kill those guys. And people will try to destroy them for their preaching because it's exposing the wickedness of, you know, Antichrist's, you know, reign but they will be supernaturally protected. All who attempt to kill these two guys will themselves be killed by fire that literally emerges from their mouths. After three and a half years of this, Antichrist ultimately will kill them. And then three and a half days later, these two guys will be raptured. Oh, wow. Get your mind around that. Fifth thought about his reign spiritually, the Antichrist. He will be unable to kill God's 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Now, remember, Matthew 24, 14, Jesus prophesied this. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So God has promised that every nation is going to hear about the gospel. How? 
It's not going to come, it doesn't appear in our day and age before the rapture, but it will come in the tribulation. Now watch this. In addition to God's two witnesses, Moses and Elijah preaching, and a special angel who will proclaim the gospel to the world, Revelation 14.6 talks about him. Don't have time to go there. But God will raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists. And these guys will be sealed or protected by God for gospel service during the tribulation. And God will, will supernaturally protect these evangelists so that they cannot be killed. And a great harvest of souls will result from their ministry. Revelation chapter 7. Let's just read a little bit about these guys. Starting at verse 3. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 from Judah, and so on and so forth. Wow, what's going on here? These guys, God's going to select and raise up 144,000, I mean radical, full-blown, Christ-filled, you know, evangelists, Jews. And these guys are going to preach the gospel. And... uh, They're going to have the seal of God on their foreheads, some identifying mark on their foreheads that will tell everyone who sees them, this guy belongs to God. Now, maybe it's going to say 777. I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say what the mark will look like, but that it will be obvious to all who see them. And these guys will be the super saints, untouchables, radical, bold, courageous evangelists, and millions of who have not heard the gospel, never heard the gospel, will turn to Christ. Those who had heard the gospel prior to the rapture, they will be deluded. But people who have not heard will turn to Christ by the millions. Revelation 7, 9 says that. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Who are these guys and gals? These are those who came to Christ in the tribulation, but were martyred for their faith because of the Antichrist's role. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me give you a sixth thought about his reign spiritually, the Antichrist. He will be killed and miraculously raised to life. Who will be killed? The Antichrist. What? Again, the Antichrist, watch this, is the master imitator. The Antichrist will watch this feign or imitate the resurrection. Why? Because he wants people to believe that he is the true Messiah. He will do everything he can to deceive the masses that he is Messiah, that he is God, and this is unbelievable. Revelation 13. Let's read this. Starting in verse 3, reading to verse 8. One of the heads of the beast, this is the Antichrist, seemed to have a fatal wound. I mean, he dies. But the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast, the Antichrist, because of this resurrection. Men worshipped the dragon, that's Satan, because he had given authority to the beast, the Antichrist, And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who was like the beast? Who can make war against him? And look at this guy. Verse 7, he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have been not written in the book of life. David Jeremiah, I'm going to quote him right here, because this is a monumental moment in in history. And he creates this hypothetical statement about what this might look like on earth. I just read. The world will go into shock. Men and women will freeze in unbelief as the global media shout of this incredible news. Headlines, president shot. Assassin kills Judas Christopher. Just a fictitious name. Christopher was pronounced dead on arrival at their international hospital of Rome this morning. The motorcade of USC officials was traveling along via Veneto when the president was hit in the temple by a single bullet. He slumped in his seat in full view of his cabinet officials and millions watching on interglobal satellite. Christopher has been hailed by leaders of every country as the greatest figure in history. He was widely acclaimed as the most brilliant politician of the second millennium. The loss in world leadership cannot be measured. As his body lies in state in the capital rotunda of the United States of Europe, the television networks will preempt every program to cover this one event. Shrining the coffin will be the governor's of the European states, the president and members of Congress from the United States of America, and the leading officials of every other country. Most of them will stand frozen in grief, and many will be openly openly weeping. Suddenly, the body of Judas Christopher stirs. He sits up. Slowly, he rises from his casket 
and walks to the nearest microphone. A gasp of disbelief is heard in the room. And then he speaks, his resonant voice reassuring everyone that he has truly been resurrected. Do not fear, my friends. I'm alive. Look at me. Three days ago, I had a bullet in my head. As you can see, I'm completely whole. My greatest wish now is to continue the unification of the nations and religions to bring together a people of all colors of faith into a peaceful coexistence. I shall have one world based upon the love and mutual respect, and the headlines will scream, He is alive! And the world will celebrate. It will happen. Maybe not exactly like that, but it will happen. He will be killed and miraculously raised to life. After his resurrection, thousands of people across the world who are undecided about the Antichrist will now make him their object of worship. This guy is invincible. Number seven, he will have a false prophet who will elicit Antichrist worship. Revelation chapter 13. Some of you are wondering, when is this guy going to be introduced? And who is he? We'll talk about him. Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast. Now, this is not the Antichrist, but another beast, and he is who we call the false prophet, coming out of the earth. He had two horns, like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Now, there's a contrast, huh? This guy's character, a lamb and a dragon at the same time. He exercised the authority of the first beast on his behalf. That is, he's the advocate for the Antichrist. And made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. I mean, things escalate now. People are being made to worship the Antichrist after his resurrection, whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, the Antichrist, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He had ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Evidently, this guy, this false prophet, uh, creates a, uh, an image of the Antichrist, probably an image that looks like him, a statue of sorts. And he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who uh, refused to worship the image to be killed. So this, we talked about the abomination of desolation. Evidently, the false prophet takes this image and moves it into the temple in Jerusalem, desecrating the temple, a literal beast that an inanimate object that is able to move and speak and freak people out and actually kill people. Wow. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark of the beast on on his right hand or his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. What's going on here? Okay. False prophet will have a twofold job description. His message, worship the Antichrist or be killed. How's that for good preaching? Second, his method, receive the mark of the beast or you won't buy or sell. I mean, this is a strategy that's going to work around the globe. Now, what is the mark of the beast? Some sort of mark on your right hand or forehead. Most believe it will be a RFID chip, we'll talk about in a second, also known as a barcode implemented under your skin. Now, again here, David Jeremiah, let me quote him. He talks about this. If you happen to access the search engine Google on October 7, 2009, you may have noticed that the usual Google logo has been replaced with a Google Doodle, a simpler barcode. If you rolled your mouse over the Doodle, you would have seen the caption, Invention of the Barcode. The doodle marked the 70, 57th anniversary of the first patent it granted to what is now the uh, ubiquitous universal product code, UPC. The patent was granted to two American graduate students. Wouldn't you like to have that? And the first use of the scanning technology occurred in, the check- in a checkout of the Mars supermarket in Troy, Ohio in 1974. Today, that code is found on virtually every commercial product from newspapers to pet food. In 1970. Before we barcoded products, today we barcode people. In his best-selling book, Shadow Government, prophecy scholar Grant Jeffrey writes, many military in- intelligence agencies, government agencies, and large corporations have introduced sophisticated security systems requiring employees to wear a badge containing a radio frequency identifying ad- identification microchip. This RFID chip 
enables companies, agencies, and organizations to monitor the location and activity of every worker during every moment that he or she is on the premises. When an employee enters the office, a computer records the exact time and begins monitoring his or her every move throughout the day. Security sensors at strategic locations throughout the office complex record the location and the duration of the activities of the badge wear. RFID scanners can be embedded in the ceilings, floors, and doorways of buildings in order to monitor the movements of people inside. RFID chips can also be sewn into the seams of clothing so the wearer doesn't even know when he is being subjected to monitoring. Since 2006, RFID tags have become standard in every new U.S. passport and many credit cards. If you never leave home without your American Express card, you're carrying an RFID tag in your billfold this very minute. So, so soon, everywhere you go, you will be tracked. Now, why do I, I read that, take the time to read that for one reason? To say this, events occurring right now show that our world is being prepared for the reign of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. If you can't see that, I don't know. Now, whatever the ultimate form, this mark will indicate you are a worshiper of the Antichrist when you take it. Having it will say to all and to God that you have rejected Christ and accepted the Antichrist as your Savior. That is going to be the sign. What will happen to those who refuse the mark of the beast? They'll be labeled traitors. Initially, they will be, ni- be, be denied the ability to buy and sell. But eventually, to uh, not have the mark of the beast on your forehead or hand will mean death. You'll be hunted down, killed, exterminated. What will happen to those who take the mark of the beast? The Bible says they'll be granted temporary physical life and purchasing power, a passport, part, a passport for a commerce business, by the Antichrist, but they will be doomed to eternal destruction by God for all eternity. They have made their choice. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11 says this, The third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength in the cup of wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and of the smoke of their torment rises up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, for anyone who receives the mark on his name. Wow, that's intense. Well, let me uh, give you another thought here. Spiritually, he will work with the false church in the beginning but then turn on the false church or religious Babylon or the great prostitute in the middle of the tribulation. You say, what's going on here? Watch this. The rapture happens. Guess what? You've got all these false religions. Anything that's not biblical Christianity is a false religion. You've got all these false religions who fill the void. And the Bible calls these false religions religious Babylon or the great prostitute. And the false church will be in bed with the Antichrist at the beginning. The first half of the tribulation. Religious Babylon, the great prostitute, they're going to aid the Antichrist in his deception and actually even persecution of the Jews and those who turn to Christ. Don't have the time to talk about that. That's Revelation 17, 1 through 6. But Satan's agenda is nothing short of total worship. Once the Antichrist reaches greater, greater political control and rises from the dead, he will destroy religious Babylon. I mean, he's going to destroy other false religious systems because he wants soul worship. Revelation 17, 16 talks about this. The beast and the ten horns, that's the ruling government at the end, will hate the prostitute. That's religious Babylon. They're going to deceive her at the beginning. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Revelation 13 tells us the whole world was astonished and worshipped the beast and asked who is like the beast. He wants to be the only savior and he will be. Ninth thought. He will function as the second person of the unholy trinity. See, Satan is the ultimate deceiver. I've given you a little picture there. You see on your outline, see that right there? Now let me take you through this. You've seen a picture of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Godhead. Well, Satan is the first person, the father of the unholy trinity. The Antichrist is the second person, the son of the unholy trinity, right? Always imitating. The Antichrist is the political leader of the world. The false prophet is the third person, the Holy Spirit, so to speak, whose main function is to direct, watch this, praise back to the Antichrist and the beast. 
Satan. He's the religious leader of the world. Wow. How effective will the unholy trinity be during the tribulation? Revelation 13.8 says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. Or, the other side is Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and following. It says, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. What's the end result of the Antichrist reign spiritually? Worship the Antichrist or be killed by him and go to heaven. So I, I, I give you a question right now. What would you decide? You won't be there gratefully, but what would you decide if you were forced to decide between honoring God by refusing the mark or accepting it for safety and security and the well-being of you and your family? Would you be like all the others and take the mark, or would you be like a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? This happened in history, something similar. Remember that? Nebuchadnezzar sets sets a a 90-foot tall gold image and says, when you hear the music, bow down before this image. Take the mark. Three young men said no. Would you be that person that would say no? They said, the God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. Wow. Right now, I want to bring us back here. This is the age of grace before the rapture. After the rapture, the age of grace is gone. A deluding influence, a judgment of God will be leveled on all who have heard but have rejected the gospel. And if that is you, you will believe the lie. And guess what? If you've not accepted Jesus Christ right now, you're already believing the lie. You are caught up in the spirit of Antichrist right now. You say, no, no, I'll change. When I get there, no, you won't. Because right now your heart is not willing to respond to the gospel. And guess what? When the Holy Spirit is gone, Christians are gone, and a deluding influence of judgment is added to your life, now is the day of salvation. Do not play with God. Eternal life and eternal death are at stake. And additionally, there is coming a time on this planet where God will force people through the Antichrist to make a choice against him by accepting the mark of the beast or for Jesus by refusing it, but then by paying the price of literally your blood being shed, you'll be martyred for your faith. Why is God doing this? It's hell. It's terrible. God is bringing this world to an end and preparing it for a new beginning. God is sovereign. He's giving people a chance. And this is your chance right now, beloved. It's a day of grace. Wow, how am I going to get through this message? Um, next thought, what will Antichrist reign be like socially? This is going to go quick. We looked at it politically, spiritually, socially. If you missed the message on the 19 judgments of God on this earth, you need to listen to that because there's huge social implications from that message. I mean, when you study worldwide famines and plagues and flooding and drought and de- 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 demonic torture of human beings and martyrdom and sickness and war and death, you can just connect the dots in your own mind. What's it going to be like in society? But I want to give you a quick 10 ways the Antichrist will reign. His reign will impact society. These are going to be quick, guys. Number one, he will build a society of deception. He will cause deceit to prosper, Daniel 8, 25. We are one nation under God, the United States. He will have one global nation built on total deception and lies. Truth will disappear from society. Two, he will create absolute terror. Daniel 8, 25, they will feel secure, he will destroy many. How's that for one sentence? Feeling secure and then being destroyed all in the same sentence. No truth, no trust. Thirdly, he will devastate society. Daniel 8, 24, he will cause astounding devastation. Four, he will overturn social laws. Daniel 7, 25, he will change the set times and the laws. The laws you now depend on, gone. He's going to change law. He will lead society to watch this, not love God, but hate God. Revelation 13, 5. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God. Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. With flattery, he will corrupt. I mean, millions will join him in his hatred and blasphemy of God. Revelation sixteen ten shows us. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven. That is society. Six, he will bring social darkness beyond comprehension. 
You read about in Revelation 9, 20 to 21, the worshiping of demons and murder and rape and sexual immorality will be rampant. Seven, he will cause societal dread. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24, 19. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women. Can you imagine? And nursing mothers, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. And guess what? God and his grace will cut it short to seven years. Revelation 9, 6. During those days, men will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. That's right. Self-inflicted death, suicide will be impossible. It will be one of the judgments of God during this time. Eight. He will reward those who support him. Daniel eleven thirty nine. He will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. I mean, yeah, you, you're in his court. He's going to reward you. He will ninth demand absolute obedience, Revelation 13, 16. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark. Every strata of society is mentioned there. He's going to force people's hand. Ten, he will annihilate everyone who opposes him. He will set out in a great rage, destroys and, and annihilate many, Daniel eleven forty four. Why? God is saying in effect, hey, you don't want me as your Messiah? Why don't you try this guy on for size? Why don't you try this guy on? How, how do you like him? Why is God doing this? He's bringing the world to an end and preparing it for a new beginning. Another thought here. What will Antichrist's reign be like economically? Wow. He is going to, watch this, he's going to promise wealth like you can't imagine, but it will end in the collapse of the global economy. Absolutely will end in all economy just terminating. Now watch this. Just, just listen here. In times of distress, and we are in times of distress right now as a world, People will accept strong centralized government to provide for them. Exactly. Exactly. We are seeing it in the United States. This is going to happen globally, and it's happening globally. We are heading for a time when virtually every person on earth will be controlled through one diabolical economic system headed by the Antichrist. Now watch this. The first attempt at a one-world global economy occurred in Babylon in Genesis chapter 11. You can read about it with the construction of the Tower of Babel by the first world dictator, Nimrod. How'd you like to have that as a name? Bummer. (laughs) The last global economy will be headed, watch this, by the final dictator, Antichrist. And this economy is described in the last book of the Bible in Revelation 18. And the capital for this global economy will be Babylon. Watch this. This is incredible. But Babylon, Iraq will be the commercial capital of the world during the tribulation when Antichrist reigns. Here's the question you've got to ask. If this is what the Bible prophesies, that the economy of the world will be centralized in Babylon, Iraq, is there any evidence right now that history is moving in this direction? This is where you've got to read this book. This is the companion book to this series. Now, I want to just quote something here because some of you are going to find this shocking. What's going on right now in Iraq? Um, when Saddam Hussein rose to power in Iraq, he conceived a grand, grandiose scheme for the rebuilding of that ancient city. He promised that Babylon's grand palaces and legendary hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, would rise from the dust, believing himself to be the reincarnation of King Nebuchadnezzar II, who had conquered Jerusalem 2,500 years earlier. Hussein invested more than $500 million toward the goal of restor- restoring the ancient city of Babylon. Saddam's extravagant plans were interrupted by U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Despite the removal from power and subsequent execution, the work of rebuilding Babylon continues. Despite its own enormous budget deficit, the United States, here we come again, are continuing to pump pump millions into Iraq. Today, the United Nations is also pumping millions of dollars into Babylon. With the help of private donors, the UN hopes to turn Babylon into a thriving center of tourism and commerce, that it will be a cultural center complete with shopping malls, hotels, and even a theme park. Watch this. The United States government is taking seriously the rise of the city of Babylon as a central place of Iraq in the future of the world. On January 5th, 2009, the largest and at $474 million, the most expensive U.S. embassy in the world was opened in Baghdad, Babylon. The 104-acre, 27-building complex is situated on the banks of the Tigris River. 
It includes 619 apartments for staff, restaurants, basketball, volleyball courts, an indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool. The embassy known as Embassy Baghdad is the largest of its kind in the world. It is the, it is the size of 80 football fields, as large as Vatican City, with a population of 5,500 people. Your tax dollars have gone to raise this up un, without us even knowing what's going on there. It dwarfs U.S. embassies all over the world. What is this saying? One other quote. Never has a world city had such rise to power as New Babylon. Never will one experience such a cataclysmic and total fall. Babylon on the Euphrates has lain dormant and foreboding for years, centuries, but mighty Babylon is really not dead. Suddenly it will rise once again. Under the impact of overwhelming geopolitical needs, it will be authorized and implemented by the unprecedented building program undertaken by the federal ten-kingdom empire of the West, then pushed to a dynamic completion by the beast. Finally, it will be inaugurated as the greatest world capital of the beast, who will have become king of all the kingdoms on the globe. Rao. Now watch this. It's going to look great at the beginning, but it is going to crash like you can't imagine. Revelation 20, or Revelation chapter 18 describes this crash of the economy that you just can't imagine. Fallen, fallen Babylon the great. I'm just reading a few verses from chapter 18. One hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn. All your riches, splendor, have vanished. In one hour the great wealth has been brought to ruin. Wow. I have so much more I want to share on this. But let me just say, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. What will, his, what will Antichrist reign be like militarily? Simple. He will lead the nations to Armageddon and to their deaths. He will lead every person on planet earth to their death. We will study this when we study the battle of Armageddon. Now, let me try to put this all together. I'm just going to go over a couple minutes because I feel like I already have. <laughs> would, you just, uh, would you just take this in? and just? I want you to look at your outline again, this little part here. Would you just look at this section called the tribulation? I want you just to look at this seven-year period of time, and I just want to read this. And this will summarize what's going to be taking place physically as well as with all the elements we've talked about. Just listen, and then we're going to pray. The tribulation is a seven-year period of time between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ, characterized by trouble, calamity, vengeance, distress, darkness, alarm, wrath, devastation, and judgment that's a, that this world has never witnessed. This will fulfill Daniel's 70th week. It will last seven years. The first three and a half years are known as the tribulation which will be characterized by war, famine, and death. There will be widespread mar martyrdom of believers, a great global earthquake. The sun will turn black and the moon will turn blood red. There will be a massive meteor shower. The sky and atmosphere will dramatically be altered, seemingly disappearing. Every mountain and island will be remo removed from its place. Earth's topography realign, will realign. Hail and fire will rain down on earth, destroying one-third of the earth, trees and grass. A massive meteorite will Cast, be cast into the ocean, producing a huge tidal wave. One-third of the oceans will be turned to blood. One-third of all sea creatures will die. One-third of ships will be destroyed. One-third of all fresh water uh, will be contaminated, bringing catastrophic death. The sun, moon, and stars will be diminished by one-third of their brilliance. Great swarms of evil creatures, demonic locusts, will be released and be permitted to torture but not kill unbelievers for four months, five months. But death will not be permitted. Even suicide will elude people. Four fallen angels will command and unleash 200 million demons who will go forth to inflict death upon one-third of the people on earth. By this time in history, just three and a half years into the tribulation, at least one half of the world's population, two billion people will have died. When the covenant of peace is broken by the Antichrist, the great tribulation will begin, characterized by demons inflicting painful, open, oozing sores on human bodies, all oceans and fresh water sources will turn to blood and all sea life will die. Drought and famine will be worldwide. The sun will scorch people with its searing fire, melting the ice caps, flooding much of the world with putrid flowing death. A painful darkness will be experienced by the Antichrist and his subjects. The Euphrates River will dry up, 
providing a pathway leading to Armageddon, culminating in the greatest earthquake and hailstorm this world has ever experienced, which will literally change the topography of this planet forever, preparing it for the second coming of Jesus Christ. This will all happen just as God has prophesied. And in the midst of this environmental chaos, which I reviewed for you, Satan will introduce his Messiah to the world as the person to bring stability. The Antichrist, Satan's superman, coming world dictator, a man who will be against Christ, will come to replace Christ. He will claim to be God during the tribulation. He will function as a ruler, a fierce king, a master of intrigue, a contemptible person, a worthless shepherd, a man of lawlessness. He will be physically attractive, an intellectual genius, a financial wizard, a political statesman, a master orator, an unbelievable administrator, a religious deceiver, the words false messiah, and will ultimately lead all surviving humanity to their deaths in the battle of Armageddon in defiance to God. What will the Antichrist reign be like politically? He will emerge out of the revived Roman European Empire. He will begin inconspicuously. He will gain public attention through diplomatic brilliance. He will designate himself, distinguish himself like no other politician ever has. He will stun the world by solving the Middle East crisis. What about his reign spiritually? Spiritual darkness will reign. Holy Spirit's removed, diluting influence added, flourishing evil will dominate. He will break his covenant halfway through the tribulation and turn on the Jews. He will persecute, torture, and kill the saints by the millions. He will kill God's two witnesses. He will be unable to kill God's 144,000 Jewish evangelists. He will be killed and miraculously raised to life. He will have a false prophet who will elicit Antichrist worship. His message, worship the Antichrist or be killed. His method, receive the mark of the beast or you won't buy or sell. He will work with the false church in the beginning, but then turn on the false church in the middle of the tribulation. He will function as the second person of the unholy unholy trinity. What will his reign be like socially? He will build a society of deception. He will create absolute terror. He will devastate society. He will overturn social laws. He will lead society to hate God. He will bring social darkness beyond comprehension. He will cause societal dread. He will reward those who support him. He will demand absolute obedience. He will annihilate any who oppose him. What about economically? He will promise wealth, but in the end, it will be the collapse of all the global economy. What will his reign be like militarily? Oh, he's just going to lead the nations to Armageddon and to their deaths. And that's what happens after, I guess, you've been in ministry 25 years. <laughs> now watch this. Um, I just want to say this at the end. If you have heard the gospel and have not responded to the gospel, this reality, the tribulation, is just the rapture away. Do you get that? Have you connected the dots? That if you've heard the gospel and you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the rapture can happen at any minute. And when that happens, it's too late for you. It's too late. A deluding influence will be added. Right now, you say, I can't believe that. But right now, for not believing, you're already taken in by Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist. My heart goes out for you. Don't mess with God. Don't play games with God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved (laughs) for God so loved the world. This is age of grace that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, man, this is so much. I'm amazed at how clear your word is about what you've given us concerning the future. Frankly, Lord, it's just, man... I'm just so grateful that it's something that I don't have to be a part of. But Lord, my heart goes out for any who are hearing this, either right now or even maybe through a podcast or whatever, and they have not invited you to be the Lord and Savior of their life. And to think that this could be their experience is terrifying. If that's you, my friend, if God has brought you here, you're hearing his word, and you've yet to believe on Jesus. This is the time. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. And you can ask Christ to come into your life. You say a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I want to be spared the horrors of the tribulation. In this day of grace, you've revealed yourself to me and I choose to believe on you as my Savior and Lord to rescue me from my sin, to grant me everlasting life, 
I want to be part of your forever family. Go to your heavenly kingdom. Thank you for hearing my prayer, saving me. I will follow you as my Savior and Lord. All God's people said,